Jitli, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the IIEA today for a conversation on a marvellous book, Alarms and Excursions, Improvising Politics on the European Stage. Uh, Luke van Mittelaar brings something quite distinctive to bear on scholarship of the European Union. He has been engaged in the world of practice, a player in the world of practice, but has always brought that sharp analytical uh, lens as a, normal, as a political theorist, uh, and also that sense of time and transformation uh, that trained historians uh, are hardwired to, uh, to grapple with. Uh, it's peppered with uh, political theorists and political theory. Hannah Arant, the political theorist of our time, but Machiavelli, wonderful political scientists, Sartori, but also our own uh, Irish political scientist, one of the greats, uh, Peter Mayer. Uh, it is bubbling with insight, and I recommend it to all of you. It's on sale, I think, afterwards uh, out there. Hodges and Figgis are here. And I particularly like, in terms of a scholar reading this, who's worked on Europe over uh, a long time, there were four things that I really liked about the book. One is that the style of politics that you present, the backstage uh, depoliticization, the front stage parliamentarization, uh, and the front stage summitry, that is very welcome because it debunks the debate which is so sterile now, the either or debate between the EU as intergovernmental and supranational. And scholars have just got to forget this. It just isn't <coughs> helpful. I was also very struck by your emphasis on language and discourse. In other words, that the struggle we all have, political actors, those who work on Europe, those who study Europe, on what is the nature of the beast? How do we describe it? And I'm always minded Donald Puchala's wonderful 1970 um, article on the EU when he <coughs> says blind men, elephants, and European integration. In other words, if you have a if you can't see and you touch different parts of this animal, then you have a very different view of what it is. And I think politicians still struggle to describe what it is they do in the EU, but also what the EU is. Uh, I also like the fact that you always present the EU not just as the Brussels Beltway, but the collective and the parts, the whole and the parts. In other words, there is no EU without member states, uh, and that to be a member state of the EU is, some, is, is to be a transformed uh, nation state. And then finally, it's a great run through all of the crises that we've had uh, in the EU over the last uh, decade. decade. Exactly. So for all of those reasons I commend it to you, I really enjoyed reading it. It reads extremely, it's, it, it reads, you just trip along, the, uh, trip along the pages and as we know, uh, the EU can be a pretty turgid, uh, it can produce pretty turgid documents. So this I recommend to you. So Luke, it's my great pleasure uh, for all of us to have you here today. And perhaps you would begin by giving us your core the core argument, what, what, why you had to write this book. Yeah, thank you, Bridget, for these uh, warm uh, welcoming words and to the IAEA to, to have me here for, for a second time, in fact. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be uh, in, in Dublin. Well, I'm, I'm really glad because you, you like it, the book for all the right reasons, <laughs> uh, which is that it is also a book, not only a set of views and what does this man think about such and such issue, but that it's also, let's say, written and that it has a sense of, 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 of language uh, to it. But for the sake of, of, of time, let me try and set out basically the core argument of the book, which, which there is. Uh, there's a lot of uh, flourish, but there's also a core, a core argument, which basically is that the European Union has undergone a transformation, a metamorphosis in these 10 crisis years uh, as an, an institution, set of institutions built to start and, and, and maintain and build a market to a club of states which is 
also able to deal with crises, with sudden twists of fate, with unexpected events. Now, in a way, I, I tell that story in, in two ways. First, it is as a, a kind of chronicle of four, the four big crises of the past 10 years. Obviously, uh, the Euro crisis where Ireland was very affected as well. Uh, but also the confrontation with Russia over Ukraine, the refugee crisis, and what I call the Atlantic crisis, where I lumped together Brexit and Trump <coughs> in the EU reaction to them. And of course, they have been followed and treated by different crowds, if I may say so, both in terms of news and in terms of academia. I mean, in the, uh, the Euro crisis, you have have the financial gigs and uh, going, uh, getting excited about spreads and in the Ukraine crisis you have your geopolitical um, experts and so on. But it struck me that in all of them the European Union as a rules-based order was confronted with some of its own limits and it was, it had to deal with certain taboos, it had to think about defining a border, like in the issue with, with Russia. And the overall transformation <coughs> I see and, and describe is that of a system doing what I call rules politics to a system also able to do event politics. Being able to react to certain changes of fortune. And the time issue here comes in, in the, sen in the sense that building a market, uh, making a rule f on hygiene or distributing uh, the, the, the fish quota among, among member states is something which is, uh, requires hard work clearly, but which you can do among experts. You can take time uh, between the commission, uh, green book, white book, uh, and, and, and the day something get, gets finally into the journal officiel or the official journal of the EU, it can be like five, six, seven years. Well, you and your people, and, uh, students and researchers in France know more about this than, than I do, uh, Bridget. So that's all great, works wonders for a market. But it does not work or it does not equip you to deal with certain circumstances. So in the period I worked there, the first big event, Capital EU, which came up was uh, the moment when Greece almost went bankrupt in, in uh, early 2010, and at some point in May 2010, there was like 48 hours to find 750 billion euros in order to make sure the euro would not collapse. So here you would not have the Commission do a white paper on whether or not uh, states should be or should not be uh, allowed to go to go bankrupt. No, this this was just. Um, maneuvering and, 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 and excitement and an extra summit and uh, Wolfgang Schäuble being flown into uh, Brussels only to fall ill, being run off into an hospital and then the Germans had to fetch another minister replacing him in somewhere down in Saxony while he was on a Sunday afternoon walk with his wife and well, I could go into the details but it just is, this is a different type of politics, not your patient, cautious, expert rulemaking, but dealing collectively with very controversial issues as well. Uh, in the Euro crisis, it was about a lot of money, but about which idea of solidarity do we defend? Yeah. In the crisis with Russia, it was about war and peace to some extent on the continent. In the refugee crisis, I know you've been sheltered here on this green island, but it was, of course, uh, very devis divisive within uh, EU member states and between them. And what do we do if suddenly more than a million people come and walk over the Balkans into Europe? What do we do with Schengen? Uh, what do we do with our asylum rules? I wouldn't say what do we do with Dublin, but that's what people in Brussels say in those cases. <laughs> um, and that brings two, two changes, 
two important changes. Um, one is, to some extent, a change of cast, a change of protagonists. There's a lot of theatrical metaphors in the book, including the title itself, which is Alarms and Excursions. And let me place a footnote here. Uh, I needed the footnote myself as well. When the publisher came up with the title, that's an Elizabethan a stage direction for the moment where uh, actors <coughs> have to be prepared on, on imminent turmoil and clamor and, and action is a moment of uncertainty in, in 16th century uh, theater. So change of cast is the first big uh, change and center of gravity in terms of political initiative going from the European Commission as the master of rules politics to the European Council, the EU summits uh, with the gathered leadership and heads of state or government collectively being able to summon the political authority to take these very substantive controversial decisions. It's not that they are more experts on things, not at all, quite to the contrary, and the smartest among them know it, but it is that they have um, a stronger political authority that they are better able to to bind or to convince, not always, but their public opinions back home, which when it's about billions of euro or about taking in refugees, or that's kind of is needed. So there's a change of, of caste, but there's also an, clearly, and perhaps that is an underestimated part of this metamorphosis, a clear, a different new experience of the public of European electorates, of public opinions across Europe about what it really means to be in the EU. I mean, of course, uh, among political science, there have been debates for, for decades on, on um, uh, permissive consensus and all these concepts that basically saying, well, people are relatively indifferent uh, to the EU. They, they may whine a bit, they may ri ridicule it a bit, uh, talk about cucumbers and bananas. But basically, as long as things are roughly okay, there will be no revolt about the EU. It was not supposed to be, as the technical word is, not supposed to be salient. And hence, national elections were not supposed to be about EU issues. Well, that has completely changed. And in, in, in the time I, I was there, uh, working for President Van Rompuy, summit chair between 10 and 2010 and 2014, there were like <coughs> 10 prime ministers and presidents voted out of office because of decisions they made or, or not during the euro crisis. Uh, the public, in a general sense, the political public, has discovered that what is decided in Ireland, in Greece, in Germany, in parliaments, by governments, or by uh, economic decision makers, has a mutual impact. Uh, voters have clearly said, and I'm not even going to talk about Brexit, that they want a say and that they also want, let me finish on that, they want the politics to be out there. They, want, they do no longer buy the message what is decided in Brussels by experts, let's say, on, on hygiene rules or on fish quota. It's just a good technical solution to a, to a problem. No, they feel that this approach of what I call depoliticization is not credible when, let's say, when it's about refugees. It's not a scientific committee which can decide how many refugees you're supposed to take in. It's not with asylum quota, like if there were fish quota, that you're going to uh, resolve that. That requires um, political debate. And, and, and leaders uh, convincing their own voters uh, that there is a joint interest to, to defend or, or, or make other cases, but at least it is a space for politics that open and therefore it requires no longer only backstage operations, to come back to that term, Bridget, uh, but also front stage uh, mm -hmm. politics. And even if that comes with a price of more noise, including no doubt a more noisy European Parliament, after the elections, I think um, there, Europe can only win from that type of noise 
in, in evolving as a, uh, as a credible political sphere. Thank you. Thank you. Can I begin precisely where you've ended up with, and that is the relationship between law and politics or technocracy <coughs> and politics, both run through the book. Uh, and when I read you, it, you relate the politics of rules very much to the market. That comes shining through. But don't rules also play a deeply constitutive role in the EU? What do I mean by that? That the EU isn't a nation state, so it can't rely on the ties that bind either culture, history. It relies on glue. Mm -hmm. And the glue has to come from treaties and institutions and process. And why is that? Because all of the member states, they kind of submit to be vulnerable. They submit to each other. And whenever anyone asks, well, why doesn't the EU have a short 10-page constitution? It's precisely because it's not a nation state. In it. So I, I, my question relates to how you see the relationship between that constitutive rule of law and rules as mm -hmm. policy making. Well, I mean, you give the answer or the start of an answer in your final line. I would indeed distinguish the two levels, the constitutional level of the, the rules of being a democracy uh, in the European space with uh, checks and balances and, and all that, from rules made by the policy-making apparatus, uh, which, of course, form part of that glue, and I, I fully realize that. And they're also what uh, has brought our, our nations and our economies uh, closely together, has knit them together. So there is a kind of trade-off there, or you, you could also say a risk, that if, if you want to uh, step out of the rules, you take a risk. But, well, in many of the cases I describe, and, and basically the focus of the book is, is on crisis politics, it's not on day-to-day -day business. Right? But take the Greek case again. What did the rules say when <coughs> Greece was about to go bankrupt? The treaty, even the short treaty, said, thou shalt do nothing. Thou shalt not act. And then you remember this was the no bill clause, obviously, Article 1 to 5 of the EU treaty. So the rules said, well, just let them go bust. But that was, would have been irresponsible. So there, a sense, and I, I know it's tricky, but this is, there, there was a need to act in the moment and to circumvent the rule. And then, at least in that moment, that's, I, I talk a lot about improvisation uh, also in this respect. And, of course, later what happened was the rule was amended. Hmm? There was a scar which had to heal. The EU treaty was an extra, was an extra line added to it. But um, so the the alternative to to a rule may not necessarily be anarchy, but it can also be powerlessness. And in those cases, I think you have to be very careful in what what you choose. Perhaps just on the lighter note on the improvisation. So uh, on, the, on this I was inspired by Miles Davis uh, on this whole uh, jazzy theme. And he once said that, uh, to reassure his audience, I will play it first and tell you what it is later. <laughs> and basically, if you, ask, <laughs> if you want to ask me one sentence, what have you tried to do? So basically, we have looked at this for 10 years let's now try and figure out what we have seen. The crises that you look at in, in, in the book, Ukraine, refugee, and the Atlantic a la Trump, running through all of those are geopolitical challenges. Mm -hmm. And it, for a long time, the EU prided itself in being this normative power Europe. If only the world out there was more like us, it would be a great world. And Putin, Crimea, but also the refugees, and now Trump, has really been a geopolitical shock to Europe. It has confronted Europe with 
its weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and also that the world out there isn't becoming more like Europe. If anything, you look across the world and it's large power politics again. How, looking across those three crises, mm -hmm. how do you think, you, has Europe, in terms of the politics of events, has it begun to get a handle on geopolitics? Or are we still very vulnerable? I think you're, you're right to see them as part of one sequence, one experience of waking up, losing naivete, uh, losing innocence in geopolitical terms. And in concrete terms, I think we're still pretty fragile. And we'll come to that. But I find it nevertheless, well, heartening is maybe too big a word, but, but to some extent good and useful and important to note is that there is this conceptual waking up first. Because really, it means a complete shift of mindset. And in Brussels, it is perhaps even stronger than you can imagine here. This idea of the founding fathers, we are basically world, uh, building a world of peace, we're starting in Europe, but it will be the avant-garde of, of, of humanity. Yeah? And the rest of the world will become like us. And you can still see that in, and this is not only falling to pieces in, in basically in recent weeks and months, uh, still see that in how we look at China, how we have looked at China. Yeah? China getting in, China becoming a market economy, China becoming a, getting a middle class and then etc. <laughs> So it really needed a few rough moments to, to, to shake up these illusions. The rest of the world is not becoming like us. And um, this, this, this sense has, has even uh, reached a Germany, which, which, of course, among the bigger EU nations, has been the one most reticent to deal with power issues. And where I was struck by uh, uh, a quote by Sigmar Gabriel, the former leader of, of the SPD, and, and, and briefly a formulist as well, who said that in a world of carnivores, we cannot be the only vegetarians. Yes. And, <laughs> and um, well, it's important to first get that right. And, to, and, and that's what these crises have done, all in their own uh, way with Russia, it was very, pretty much a border issue, ge hard geopolitics, refugees also to some extent, and of course with Trump, it is the 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 uh, European dependence on on the U.S. security, which is uh, put into stark uh, relief now, and um, concretely, in terms of the. The frailty or the vulnerability of, uh, of the EU, I think a strong example and to some extent humiliating example is, is the way how, how the Americans have treated us as Europeans on the Iran deal. Well, you, many of you will, will, will remember huh? a deal to uh, make sure that the Iranians would not uh, develop um, nuclear weapons which was in our strategic and economic interest, which Trump wants uh, or has ripped apart uh, against uh, withdrawing the American signature against the wish of the three <coughs> European nations plus the EU plus Russia and China with the power of the extraterritorial power of the dollar, basically, um, to put it simply. And we were pretty naked at the EU has tried to, and including London, by the way, working with Berlin, Brussels, and Paris, to uphold the deal building. Well, now we're getting uh, uh, too technical, but a special purpose vehicle, kind of truck mechanism allowing to. It's very important, yeah. But it's, it's, it's fragile, it's, but it's, it's like a seed. That's how I like to see it, uh, which <laughs> is planted, which may grow into something bigger, yeah? like the ESM. <laughs> Well, it was a pretty big seed, but it was also started as a, as a kind of improvised uh, thing, the EFSF. I'm afraid here you will remember the acronym. Um, and which <laughs> has over time grown into something bigger and more important. And this, 
Iranian thing might also become more important. But it's, of course, it's not, not enough. But the awareness is growing among leaders and I also think among public opinions. Bef one last uh, question before we go to the audience. Uh, your last chapter is about opposition, mm -hmm. politics, and how, the, how there can be opposition in the EU system. And I just wonder, is the problem how you organise opposition, or is it a much deeper structural problem about how politics, democratic politics, is or organised in Europe? In other words, that the EU, because it's a compound political system with the national and the European, the states and the people, that it is extremely difficult in a system like that to have to allow for opposition that doesn't take the house down. And when we look at, I mean, the European integration is a political project, so the surprise is not that there is opposition to it, but that it took so long to emerge. It should have, one would have expected, given how significant it was, that there would be opposition long before it emerged, and I think that goes back to salience. But now that there is opposition, how can opposition be structured in a way that it isn't Euroscepticism? Because a lot of what passes for Euroscepticism, in my view, is simply Europhobia. So whenever you hear a senior politician describe the EU as akin to the Soviet Union, forget it. Just don't bother listening to them. This is, they're not actually looking at the political system as it is. So how can there be dissent, which is necessary in politics, but without it, in a sense, that, that for, for example, in the United States today, there's really deep roi roiling politics, but no one questions the future of the United States. But in Europe, we worry that the next European elections can take the House down. I don't believe they will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that's an exaggeration. But I do think there's a structural problem of politics in the EU. Well, yeah. I agree, and what I what I do in this final chapter, in a way, is the Peter Mayer chapter, because I I draw inspiration from uh, well, what Peter Mayer and, and others, but how they, how Peter Mayer analyzed that issue of opposition, and basically he said, he wrote in a in a piece more than ten years ago that if the EU would not allow for opposition within the system, the opposition would organize against the system or in other terms if you do not have classical opposition in a system like okay you have opposition and government and you go to the ballot box and you can vote out your government you get new policies or at least new political personnel if you don't have that you risk uh, harvesting principle opposition of principle or as you say uh, opposition who wants to uh, take the house down or to get out, uh, uh, which uh, exit, of course, is also a form of principal opposition. I think it has very much to do indeed with the structure of the EU, but also with its DNA of depoliticizing everything. That was the magic trick. Take the politics out of any conflict, huh? uh, be it uh, from the very start, uh, France and Germany haggling about coal price and then EU or European civil service would say, well, stop, stop that. We're going to come up with a solution agreed by the experts and we're going to, or we, we will find a compromise. But basically any conflict was transformed into a technical problem which you could solve also by legal means. And it's a great trick, but it does not work for the issues uh, we have been talking about and the issues which have defined these crises, peace, war, borders, solidarity, uh, culture, identity. And, but it is a very uh, strong um, element this depoliticization of almost everything the EU does, the consensus culture, including in the European Parliament, strangely enough, which is 
uh, has, from the 1950s even, always had a centrist consensus, not only a federalist consensus, but always has sought, uh, like what you today call grand coalitions of, of, the, of the socialist and, and, and the Christian Democrats. So over time, indeed, the effect has been that critical voices have been muted, disqualified, cast as anti-Europeans, because if you did not agree with a rule or a proposal, you were supposed to have not understood it, because it was clearly a reasonable proposal, and you were stupid. Or, alternative, you were simply not a good European. A kind of moral argument, which was not played out, or is not being played out so explicitly so much anymore, but you can still sometimes feel it. And I, I must say I have a personal allergy <laughs> against that kind of uh, argument. And so it's so important to, to find a stage where, where you can have uh, a different kind of political confrontation. The European Parliament, I think, perhaps to, to conclude on that after the, uh, the next elections of, of May, it will be a more noisy Parliament will probably be a, a, a swing to the right as well. Um, there will, it will probably put an end to the grand coalition in the sense that you will need three, four parties to get a majority. Well, I think there are also advantages to that. Uh, you will have less backroom deals between the, the socialists and, and the Christian Democrats. Uh, Greens, liberals, or the conservatives may, may also throw in their, uh, their lot. And, I find these predictions, including by lofty intellectuals, Bernard Henri Lévy, uh, writing letters, George Soros, predicting the end of European civilization if, if, if we don't want, really, no, it's, it's all out there, huh? yeah. exaggerated. Completely. And, um, <coughs> and, and uh, not helpful. But of course, the question is whether uh, these parties, let's say Orban and Salvini and however they will organize themselves, whether they will play the role of an opposition, a classical opposition, striving to get other policies, or whether they will undermine the system from within as a principled opposition to, to and, and there we have, I mean, we have to be very careful also in view of the rule of law. But I'm open to that happening and I think one should embrace that kind of uh, noise, which will make the European Parliament a more credible place because its weakness is not its lack of formal competences. It has more than many national parliaments. Its, its weakness is its distance to, to the voters, the fact that people feel it does not represent them. And if it represents uh, the plurality of voices within the European electorates more credibly, you will paradoxically, in fact, get a stronger European Parliament. I, I mean, one of the surprises is that with the rise of Eurosceptics, numbers of Eurosceptics in the Parliament since particularly 2014, but in, a f in, in essence, they really weren't interested in doing politics in the Parliament. They were far, they didn't, you know, work the committees, they didn't do any work. They just wanted to collect the money to fight domestic battles. Le Pen exactly. and Farage are the classical are the classical e examples. So now open to the floor, please. And if you wouldn't mind telling our speaker who you are, please. And just a brief comment on my question. Um, you spoke of the Union's strategic capability to deal with Russia. Um, I think the Union is facing a real loss. And just to mention, I think we shouldn't underestimate the significance of, being, of using Dr. Merkel over the next couple of years, whenever that happens, in terms of her lived experience of the Iron Curtain, fluent Russian, uh, dozens and dozens of one-on-one -on -one meetings with, with Putin, um, as well as structured summits. And I think that's a really significant strategic loss, which I think in a way the UN perhaps may have to plan for. Just a brief question, though, on the presidency of the European Council. Uh -huh. Given that President Tusk is coming in his final months, um, your own ring 
inside Secret Time to employ over those five years. I, I'd love you to share with us how you would profile the skills, the qualities, the vision of the person needed now to take on that role. And would you like to give us your sense of whether that profile fits, for example, Hutte, Merkel, or indeed some other candidate you might like to suggest? Well, I will not go that far in, <laughs> in sketching profiles, but I think um, both Van Rompuy and Tusk had their big crisis. Uh, for Van Rompuy, it was the Euro crisis, which has defined his presidency and which also got the best out of his experience and talents in the sense that he was trained as an economist and a philosopher. <coughs> He used to quip that the second quality was more important during the crisis than the first, uh, to keep calm and to have a right perspective on things. Uh, but also, let's say, trained as a negotiator in Belgian politics, holding together at the end of his term of prime minister a five-party coalition. Yeah? And in the EU, you had 27, 28-party coalition to some extent. Um, and so he was extremely important there, the right man at, 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 at the right time. The Tusk presidency, I will bracket Brexit, has been more defined by the refugee crisis, which uh, it's difficult to look at it this way now that we're in the existential phase of Brexit, but has been more important for the EU in terms of shattering uh, and in terms of immediate danger, at least, again, uh, than uh, Brexit, at least so far. And there, he has less been the negotiator. <coughs> he, he has picked the fight with Merkel, shifted uh, on behalf of most members of the council, I, I should say, in this dramatic summer of autumn of 2015, winter 2016, uh, and feeling that the balance had to be restored in terms of uh, our, our uh, imperative of, of charity, of, of opening up to refugees, and also our duty as, or his duty or their duty as political leaders to protect the borders. And he has, <coughs> in the Atlantic crisis, he has been more vocal, both on Brexit and on, on, on Trump than Van Rompuy would have been, but I think it was important he has become President Tusk, that is, a voice uh, in his own right, a credible or a recognizable voice on the European stage. So there you see two rules. I think you have to be somewhere uh, in between or, or, or combine both the, the confidence man, hmm? because, I mean, imagine you're President of the European Council, you, unlike the President of the Commission, who has a massive apparatus, a big budget, who, who, uh, who can initiate legislation, you have nothing. Right? You have a few treaty lines, but you have no real uh, power. You cannot even nominate power, nothing. Yeah? So you, first and foremost, you rely on the trust of your peers. Around that table <coughs> of 28 leaders, and nobody else in the room. Uh, and I think they both have that. Um, and won the trust of their peers. And it's also true, you mentioned two uh, names that are uh, floated, Prime Minister Rutte from the Netherlands, Merkel, well, it's, they have been there for eight, nine years, uh, Merkel even since 2005. So they, they have the starting point, which is uh, the confidence of, of, uh, of their peers. And reaching out to the wider public comes only second. Huh? If you do that without having um, without being able to, sp to speak on behalf of the council, you will not get very far. Again, it's perhaps different for the Commission President. And uh, to conclude on an Irish note, I was very happy to have, when I left the Van Rompuy Cabinet, I still worked for three months for President Tusk. I was happy to help him recruit an Irish Hugo. successor. Hugo. Uh, some of you may know me, he's even worked here, but that must have been ages ago, Hugo Brady, uh, who has, in a way, helped Tusk to also find that uh, outspoken uh, voice, and I think it has done you well, including in the Brexit uh, <laughs> work, where Tusk has been very 
supportive of Ireland. Ireland. He has indeed. Uh, no. Uh, it was a great pleasure to read your earlier book, Passage to Europe, and the pleasure has continued with the dialogue between you and Richard. Uh, I'd just like to come back to your point about uh, Europe as an avant-garde. I've always found very appealing the description of the European Union as a union of states and peoples. Uh, that sort of, you know, rather than going federal or whatever. Um, and I've also often thought that just as the sovereign state, which is the kind of paradigm for world order at the moment, could be traced back to Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries, so maybe, just maybe, after all the turmoil in Europe, we had evolved a new paradigm or was beginning to emerge, the birth of a new idea, uh, these Europe of states and peoples with values and knowledge of it and so on. And to some extent, I suppose you would say that it was easier for that to come into existence because the carnivore aspect was more or less uh, what do you say, delegated out to NATO in Europe. Uh, we can, cannot speak for much about that because we're not in NATO and we want to be. But uh, nevertheless, that aspect was sort of hived off to an extent. So I'm just wondering if that concept, first of the Union of States and Peoples, and more importantly, of the value based knowledge of idea and possibly being, being some sort of sign of a possible future way the world order might develop is completely dead. I, I'm not misty-eyed about it, but I just wonder if it's just a matter of rhetoric, or if there is still some hope for keeping it alive uh, and, and developing it. Well, that's a very pertinent question, thank you. Uh, but I think there are two, in fact. One is union of states and peoples, that's more a kind of constitutional or institutional question on, on what the EU uh, could look like and to what extent it can develop into a full-blown federal state along the line of the United States. Well, there, let me be brief. I have more in the book, but I do not think that will happen for, for historic and, 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 and political reasons. European states will continue to work more closely together under pressure uh, of events because of the treaties they have concluded but it will not end up with Brussels being like Washington today. The other issue, the, the um, normative power of, of the European project, will that go away? No, not completely. But I think it can only uh, survive if, if we take it for what it is. And that is, it is not the... Um, the gospel for the whole world. Hmm? We will have to recognize that this is, and we can call it values, we can call it to some extent even interest in the sense of what we find important. It's our way of life. Eh? The things we hold uh, dear to. We want to protect them and we will have a hard job and we will have to fight for it to protect that world and our values within our European space. I think the idea of um, of exporting those values to the rest of the world, to China and Russia, is that, in a way. Uh, it, uh, because that's, well, that's the carnivores out there and perhaps uh, situation might change, you never know, but there we are clearly closer to the 17th century Westphalian world you, you refer to in your question uh, than uh, at any point between 1950 and 1990. But I think it is important also to, to um, have that sense of identity or glue, as you called it, uh, Bridget, earlier on, more than than just rules and, 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 and treaties, that we can be and should be proud of, of, of some of these values and our ways of, of, of doing and also realizing that that is what we share as, as, as European nations. So that we should preserve, but as, lo as soon, I think, as we get into the, um, 
into, well, the exporting, or you can find theological uh, analogies um, mode, it will backfire and it, it, it will not work. Paul? Paul Gillespie from the Institute. I like your, your, your use of Peter Mayer, and, and his central point was the, the, the lack of politics, the lack, the lack of therefore the capacity to handle the events that you described, and that transition from rules to events in his very rich way of, of approaching the subject. So uh, congratulations. Uh, what I want to really add, uh, building on the other, uh, other questions, is whether you see that transition towards events management and the negotiating skills and the dealing with the geopolitics of the multipolar world, uh, whether that feeds back, uh, if, even in a second order way, uh, back into political legitimacy. Because if, if the visibility of handling that, the world is getting both smaller and, and, and more diverse, uh, the, the visibility of handling that actually, in some ways, re-establishes uh, another layer of politics at European level. So if one can look at that constructively, notwithstanding the noise and notwithstanding the gloom from some of the polar intellectuals, mm -hmm. uh, that actually this is, uh, and within the m more modest, normative uh, ambition of the, of the whole project, in which you have to deal uh, with uh, China and you don't export the world and you don't proclaim yourself as the West, in a world that is no longer Western. Uh, actually, it, it's more constructive than maybe it, it looks. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree, uh, obviously. Uh, and, um, and that that type of politics, you're right to add, brings its own legitimacy. Uh, and one of the, you also mentioned um, the word visibility, which is, which is key in my whole approach uh, to to politics and, 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 and political thinking. Visibility is, is a very precondition of le legitimacy. Huh? Political actions have to be uh, visible so that people can relate to them, that they are embodied to some extent, that, they, uh, uh, that it's not only a technical apparatus producing uh, rules or, or, or decision, but that there are real people out there who commit themselves uh, to such and such decision. And I think it is perhaps closer to a French view of politics. Huh? You know, French presidents like to see of themselves as action man, uh, solving one crisis after the other, and, and a bit less perhaps tuned to uh, consensual parliamentary style politics. Uh, but still, you, you need both, and, and um, the European Union will have to increase its capacity to harvest also that kind of legitimacy having to do with protection <coughs> uh, to, to, to survive. Those who don't, uh, we have to wait 
until people catch up. And I suggest to you that there's too much emphasis on suppressing conflict, because conflict can be used uh, as a means of greater understanding, and that may take time. It doesn't always lead to violence or chaos. Well, well I, I fully uh, agree with the gist of your argument that a conflict can, can lay out uh, positions uh, clearly in the open, which, and then allow everybody to see also the, well, the, the, the power relations uh, be between the two positions. I would just add on, on your first comment, and coming back to what you said on, on uh, Marine Le Pen and Farage basically using the European Parliament for money, I would add a second thing they used it for, which visibility. is visibility. Yeah. Exactly. YouTube films, huh? YouTube excerpts. So they used it as a stage as well. Uh, yep. to be able to communicate to their voters quite directly. And they even used the European Parliament audiovisual services uh, <laughs> for all of those. And uh, I think one sentence that, let's say, the generation Salvini Orban, they will want to do the politics as well. They yeah. will want to uh, yeah. be involved in the policy making, and the, there will be a generational shift there. Now, we have two finals, so I'll take them together because I'm conscious of the time, so please. Yeah, so okay. we're just going back with the Institute. Just two, two themes, one has been parties on already. In the nature of the sort of national versus the EU institutional relationship, uh, how do you evaluate the tendency which, uh, in the Irish experience of uh, other experiences too, exists, to say, look, at Brussels won't do, Brussels won't give, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're okay, they're unreasonable over there, uh, and there is sort of a blame culture due to national policy or performance uh, deficiencies. That is, that national uh, the parties and the national administrations tend to push on to Brussels. What do you think of that particular uh, sort of uh, dilemma, if you like? And secondly, and this was touched on already, and your events-based politics and rules-based politics, I mean, you could argue uh, that Right, you say the European Union, and maybe with secret German political support, probably. So, you know, at the critical points that you you you, you had a, an ECB constrained by the treaties and what its duties were, but you also have a certain elasticity that I, I would do what it takes. Whereas, if you had a treaty, it did quite the opposite, and you know, went back into a technocratic bunker. So, it, it just like you could elaborate on those two um, issues a little bit, the, the, the blame culture on Brussels, and secondly, the importance of personality at critical times. Thank you. We'll take the last question. Oh, thank you. Uh, Max Mead, my research here has a somewhat related question. I was uh, interested in your thoughts on uh, in, the, the increasing uh, accountability of member state executives, because Brexit, I suppose, at least in part, seems to be an, an extreme result of, of a member state executive leveraging the, the sheer complexity of, of the competency allocation in the European Union to point a finger at Brussels while at the same time not being able to uh, being able to sort of not take responsibility for its own actions. I was wondering within the current treaty framework do you see that development increasing of and, and the, the increased focus on the council, do you see a, an increasing trend in, in that direction of more accountability, and does, is there a limit to it? Uh, I think you need to add two sentences so that I understand your question even better. Uh, essentially, uh, do you think there can be full accountability within the current, considering the current complexity of competencies, uh, at, of, of member state executives for their actions uh, within, in, in Brussels? for how they, how they make decisions, or for the for their part they play in decisions being made. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with that and then I'll, I'll come to, to, to your questions. I think uh, complexity should never be an excuse for any government ducking its responsibility. Huh? Uh, complexity is what bureaucracies produce and love to produce. Uh, a government should be able to make a situation readable scrutable and to say this is important this is our priority so i do not think there is a contradiction there and perhaps and this brings me also to your uh, williams question on, on the blame game perhaps governments have used 
or abuse sometimes the Brussels complexity to, to duck that uh, responsibility, but they, they should be punished for it. And I would add to your first question that some leaders have learned from uh, David Cameron's unhappy experience in spending 10 years blaming Brussels for everything and then thinking he could win an important existential referendum in, in uh, uh, two jolly months of uh, campaigning. Uh, uh, if I think of the Dutch Prime Minister uh, Rutte, uh, he has sh shifted gear, changed his language in, in a few hours, literally, after the 23rd of June 2016, and has, has realized that uh, if he ever were to come in that position, he needs a track record of a more, uh, well, let's say, more positive, more credible, and more engaged, in any case, uh, European, uh, European discourse. The tendency will, will remain, but um, the uh, electorate will also punish those blame games including because the, the public space is all open, everybody is reading everybody's papers and, uh, and so on. I will finish on, on Draghi because I, I, I like that question and in a way what Draghi did there perfectly illustrates how even the European Central Bank, a pure technocratic body, huh, balances there on, on, the, on, on, on a court between the, the rules politics and the advanced politics. Uh, you quoted that middle part of its sentence, I'll do what it takes in, uh, to these London bankers to, to save the euro. And then there were two things. On the, at the end of the sentence, he said with his uh, Roman voice, and believe me, it, it will, will be enough. Be enough. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pure bluff. Huh? That was saying, OK, if you bet against me, my basement is deeper than yours and, and you will lose your money. Huh? So bluff typically is something from the toolkit of the event politician, huh? not of the civil servant. Huh? <laughs> Sarkozy is a great bluffer as well. Huh? And Trichet was, uh, sorry, uh, not Trichet, right? No. Draghi was playing from that playbook. But his famous sentence starts with three sometimes forgotten words, within our mandate, comma, we will do whatever it takes, and believe me. So you've got the whole stretch from, okay, we have a mandate. This is we're doing rules politics, and we will act. So I think it is it's one of the most brilliant uh, phrases on the on the whole crisis, and he rightly deserves his nickname Super Mario only for that. Thank you. <laughs> I I think you can historians will look at every single document or speech made by the cent by all of the central bankers. And you will not find one that there isn't cover on the legal mm -hmm. and on the mandate. Everything was covered by one sentence. It wasn't always this one, but it was the proper functioning of monetary transition or something. They always had cover. They never once were going to be accused as central bankers that they had acted ultra vires. They were at the edge <laughs> all, the, all the time. Well, I think we have to bring uh, this wonderful conversation to an end. Uh, thank you very much for giving us of your time. It's a terrific book uh, and terrific in so many different ways because uh, the world of politics is today at a time of shift and shock and transition. Uh, and it matters not just in terms of how we look at the world, but it actually matters to what will happen in our world. Uh, and that's why this is an important book, but also a great read. Thank you very much.